little bit something different, especially with the weather that's going on and I was a little bit uh, unsure about who was going to come down, but thank you all for making the effort and coming down and as much as we're here to obviously talk some basketball and have some fun with all of that, which we'll do, it's great to get so many people down here and we're raising some money for Youth Focus, which is something that's been really important to me and the fact that we're able to do this and have a good night for a good cause is really important and that's only possible because of everyone here. So I thank you and the people that work for Youth Focus, thank you all for coming down. And to kick things off, our first guest is a man named Will Weaver and I've been lucky enough to get to know Will a little bit the past year on my travels in America and he's kind of taken Brett Brown's mantle as the adopted American son of Australian basketball. He now coaches the Sydney Kings and he spent some time, he's working with the Boomers this week as well. And he's worked with Mitch Creek, for instance, who I know a lot of NBL people will know. And he's really an interesting man and he's agreed to come in and talk to us. So please give an interesting, well not interesting, a big round of applause for Will. <laughs> I would have guessed interesting would be the most generous welcome I might get in the current Bronze country. So well, we've got plenty of time where we can talk to some thank of Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we've been joking about this for a year. It's your first time in Perth and you've brought the rain with you. What are any impressions? Do you have any of our little city so far? I've just been such a fan from afar. Obviously, the, the Boomers players that I've got to be around and, and coaches um, working with Trev Gleason and um, their physio and their soft tissue, like we've had just so many connections to the Wildcats given the fact that they've been the most successful club in the league for a while now. And so um, Mitch Norton and Jesse Wagstaff and Damo obviously and all those guys, uh, Matt Nielsen, Adam Ford who's now on my staff in Sydney, it's, it's obviously been the club to sort of look to as uh, the gold standard. And so from a basketball point of view, it's just exciting to be in Perth and play games here. I know they're having games here for a while on a national team level, so that's exciting for the Boomers team and for me specifically, who's new to the country, and all my time has been spent basically in Melbourne with these Boomers tours in the past because of, um, you know, a lot of guys are based there and it makes it sort of easier for transit to get to the different places we've had these major tournaments, but yeah, it's been, it's been great to be here and I'm excited just about what the atmosphere is going to be like for these two games. Did you get to King's Park yesterday? Not yet. I'm excited, I'm excited about it. It up. And you touch it then, your reason you are in Perth was the boomers obviously and if things are about to get going this week, I remember when we spoke last December it was all about planning to get into almost this week and getting the team together and just assaulting what is going to hopefully be a very big month. Does that bring a sense of excitement not just with you but the whole infrastructure to finally be here I suppose and to get going with what I know you guys hope is going to be a very fun month ahead? Yes. Um... You know, major tournaments are rare, and when I came into the program five years ago, my first year was the last World Cup, 2014, and so for me, I was I didn't know what I didn't know. You know, I was just a stranger in a strange land, and I was the only foreigner, and uh, by the end of that campaign, I just realized that I've never enjoyed the sport more than around those group of guys, and getting to represent you know, the green and gold tradition of the boomers. And so, um, and then, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, we're qualified for Rio and we go into that experience and then you're like, oh wait, now we gotta do that again. We gotta qualify, there's all this work that went into that that we had to do now. So, <coughs> to be here, um, looking forward to achieving something that I hadn't achieved is exciting. And you touch on that experience group and I suppose the camaraderie and all those cliche terms I know we throw around but we do and you at your disposal now have that core group of guys that we in Rio we've got Paddy and Joe, Deli and Bogues and all of those sort of guys. I suppose as we're well, not an outsider anymore but you're obviously American and you stepped into this world what was it like observing I suppose these group of players you've dealt with the NBA players before and not saying that the Australian guys are anything better or worse but they've definitely got a sense of camaraderie that makes them distinct. What was it like stepping into that world and that ecosystem? They have a list of you know, these posters that are really the only signage we have in our meeting rooms and even on the court, um, training over at Bendat, of every guy that's worn the Boomer singlet in a major competition. And it's, it's not a big poster, you know. Um, and 
that's what you feel more than anything, what I feel more than anything, being around these guys. They acknowledge that and covet that and um, appreciate the chance to be one of those guys. And I think one of the things that Brett and Andre and you know the continuity of staff and players that have been around since London and a little bit before this sort of phase of the program has identified that this is a remarkable opportunity. And the way the global landscape is shaped out, we have we have the chance to capitalize. And so the feeling is a combination of reverence for what's happened and excitement and nerves and um, anticipation for what this month and the next you know, 18 months could mean to the team, the program, the country, all of it. And I'm sure there's some people that are sitting in the crowd wondering how someone from Texas who was working in Philadelphia ends up working within the Boomers program and working, you're sitting here in Perth, which is a million miles away from where your journey started. And I know we've spoken about before about when you were watching Brett Brown at the London Olympics when he was agitated and doing his thing on the court. So I suppose just for the people here, how did you come into contact with Andre Lamanis and I suppose getting into this world that seems so normal for us, but it's a uh, halfway around the world as I say from where you started your basketball career? Yeah, so briefly it was uh, working for Brett as his video coordinator in the Sixers. Uh, before that happened, I had gotten hired by the GM there, Sam Hinkie, and as we he was going about the coaching search, I was doing a lot of the research on candidates, and a big part of that was looking back at game film and interviews, and um, Brett was identifiable in terms of his energy, his passion, and the way that his team played. Um, he described them as a bunch of bartenders, you know, that was his affection, term of affection for the guys that were on that London Olympic team, because they just had a crack, and, you know, Patty obviously led the tournament scoring, and they played relentless pace and energy, but he, in that environment, it was just so different, I think, than what NBA coaches were at that time and even are now. And so I was intrigued from that point, and then obviously getting the chance to work alongside him. Andre Lamont has joined us for a week or two of, during his visits of checking in on all the American based players. And I quickly raced to the front of the line to host him. And so I spent a little time around him during that season. And at the end of the year, I just asked Brett, do you think it'd be possible for me to volunteer with the Australian national team? Like, given the fact that I knew at that point there were human resources were limited and that um, there was a major tournament coming up and that they might be in need of some more uh, human capital, I suggested, hey, look, August is kind of a dead month for the NBA. Would you feel OK doing being a part of that? Uh, and he organized it all, Andre brought me in just as we'll sort of, there's a lot of work to do, we'll see how it goes. And yeah, we're, we're all in tears in the locker room after Brazelic kicked that shot uh, when we lost to Turkey on that buzzer beater. And um, over the course of the next couple of days, you know, Andre approached me and said, I'd like him to stay with us through Rio. And um, obviously, we have to qualify for Rio and help us do that. And it obviously has changed my life for the better in, in so many ways. The obvious ones being that I get to live um, now in Australia. The maybe not so obvious one is just the, the people that I now count as friends and colleagues and um, the excitement that I surely have and I think most people that are involved have reuniting every couple of years or you know, sort of pick up where they left off. So. And how have you, I don't know if it's the right word, but I suppose coaching in the NBA and around American basketball is one thing, but you step into this boomer's world and one week you might be in Lebanon, then you might be in the Philippines in one of just the most crazy atmospheres in the planet. And it's obviously, it's basketball still, but there's a completely different subtext to, I suppose, FIBA basketball when you're representing a country. How, I suppose, has that influenced you? Has that influenced your coaching style, your methodologies? Are there things that you can sort of think of that go, yeah, I learned that from being around this world, not just Australian basketball, but I suppose, more of the international flavor where it gets more parochial? I think the thing I've learned more than anything is that um, there just aren't better athletes on the planet from my perspective, you know, being involved in a team sport than Australian. I think that uh, 
my experience in the G League was an incredibly positive one, and I think the team was picked thoughtfully with culture in mind, and uh, maybe it was atypical in the way that we focused on the people that we were selecting, not just their skill sets. But still in all, like coaching 11 G Leaguers and one Mitch Creek, the chance to come coach 11 Mitch Creeks and one G Leaguer sounded really good to me, you know? Uh, and that, I think, reflects the fact that uh, it just seems, not that I'm some sort of culture, you know, critic, but it just seems like growing up with mateship as a driving principle and having from the time you're young um, something that is very similar, if not congruent, to what being a teammate is all about has a lasting impact. And that our guys represent that and are emblematic of that in a lot of ways. Um, and, and frankly, that's part of why I'm eager my nine-month-old son to come live here and, and experience that and feel that from his age rather than waiting until he's you know, 28 years old or wherever it was I first came out. And you, you mentioned Brett Brown before as well and anyone that meets Brett you can just instantly recognise he's got this energy, this drive and I think the people in the room tonight that would know him, know him as a former Boomers coach, they know him as Ben Simmons as coach now you were lucky enough to work around him and be side by side when things weren't so, I suppose, easy in Philadelphia. What did you learn from being around someone like Brett on a daily basis and just having him, I suppose, and being able to sponge everything that he brings to the table? I learned a lot from Brett. You know, I think the most uh, endearing quality of him is how much he learns from the players and how focused he is on his role rather than thinking of himself as a leader other than just symbolically. And so uh, that's something I mirror. And I think Andre is maybe the best example of anybody I've been around. Um, that this isn't the Brett Brown show, this isn't the Andre Lamont show. This is about creating an environment where these guys can play really well. And they feel confident and strong and fit and prepared. And um, that part of Brett's energy just focuses on, so much of Brett's energy focuses on that end, people get that, you know, players feel it, um, and the, what we're trying to do at Sydney and what's happened here in Perth and what went on with the Breakers before was the sum total of enough people all pointing in the same direction trying to do those sorts of things, and that's really the only thing I can think of that's worth spending any time on, right? It's just a chance to collaborate and work with people that care a lot and are willing to sacrifice in order to achieve the thing that they care about. And even just speaking of Sydney, as much as you were talking about your son and the reasons you're coming out here, it is a big move and you are trusting your career to work in the NBL and around Australian basketball now on a full-time basis. And we all talk about that here, how the NBL is growing, how Australian basketball is growing. And we almost carry it as a badge of pride because it's it's our sport, right? it's our culture. But again, as someone that stepped into, I suppose, Australian basketball, what are the characteristics that, I don't know if we see them or not, but why is Australian basketball, quote unquote, accelerating around the world, in your mind? It just seems prime. It just seems, um, it seems like the perfect home for almost any sport. I think it's a passionate sporting culture. I think that the, Athletes will play for less money to be here. It's a, it's a big place people want to be. Um, it has the, some of the best sports science. You know, it exports probably more sports science gurus than any other place on the planet. And that helps players play longer and get more out of themselves and stay healthier and feel like they might be able to play with their kids when they're older, not just you know, use their body up towards the end of career. Um, I, it's such an easy job to recruit people to Australia largely, but Sydney specifically for that, those reasons. And the, I, I don't think it can be overstated just what, um, what's been done from a leadership standpoint to create the environment where this thing has blossomed. But it's also like, I think the anomaly was the dip. I don't think the anomaly, you know, it, the popularity it had was founded on all the same things. And it seems like just trying to kind of get out of the way and let it, the sales regain some of that is, is 
really what's called for. Yeah, and I think from, I suppose, my media viewpoint, the real Olympics would be for that because it was almost a rallying cry and got everyone back on, not back on track, but it was, there was that rallying point as that central figure and as much as I know it hurt for it to end the way it did, I think almost having that moment is a galvanising point and from my point of view we've seen that over the last three years and just how much excitement there is for the next month and it's not just the next month, it's what the next month symbolises. I think we've even been making an all-star team in February and the fact that people pull out of this team that we've got here this week, we've still got half the team's NBL guys, half the team's NBA guys, it doesn't really matter where these guys play anymore because I think the point is they've got choices now, right? They're playing for, I suppose, you in Sydney or playing here in Perth or the Wildcats. The money not might not be there, but lifestyle-wise and so culture-wise, it seems like these, I suppose, stepping stones of these clubs are on par with anything that's pretty much not in the NBA. And you just have such sterling representatives of, um, I mean, each guy's story is a novel, but Nick K has done, and Ken Clinton, the two of them, right? Both with their WA connection. Like they are, uh, they've done the hard yards. Like they have really pushed us into this position. And it was far from assured. Like we played well in the Asian qualifiers, but um, the seeding that we were able to attain because of how we played and what that means in terms of being in the group we're in and not the group that sets up even worse or the side of the bracket, like all that stuff matters. And we lose sight of it because it's just, okay, what's next? Okay, what's next? But when you do pick a team and you start to feel some of the uh, you know, you get comments from former boomers and people in the industry and, uh, you know, meet people who follow it closely, the, by and large, it's like, wow, that's cool. You know, like that, what people that know these players, I think, are excited to have them represent. Yeah. And so I suppose with the World Cup on the agenda now, we all want to win gold, we want to progress and we want to win games obviously. But I'm just interested, what are the things that I suppose are in your control as coaching staff as infrastructure? Because if shots don't go in, they don't go in. If you have a bad game, well, that happens. But what are the things you as I suppose an infrastructure around the guys are the things that you're trying to control over the next week or two? I suppose getting everyone in a position where come that first Sunday in China, you're saying yes, we're confident that we've got the guys where they need to go, and it's just up to the games now. Health is the first one, right? So you just try to keep your guys healthy and fit and available, and, and availability is the best ability. So we spent the past hour right before I rushed out to come here talking about what tomorrow looks like and trying to come up with a framework that reflects the fact that Nathan Sobe just flew in from having the birth of his first child, you know, got in late last night and practiced hard this morning, and he's on his own plan, uh, trying to look after some of our guys that played deep in the NBA season and are still, you know, trying to try to find the low for them to come back up to this high. Um, so that's the first thing, and that's obviously going to interact with these games against Canada. Um, you know, we're, we're very much focused on September 1st, and so, how we manage rotations and how many minutes people play and whether everybody plays both games, like those are the conversations we're having now to try to think about what's strategic given what our goals are. Um, but in general, these campaigns have more lead up games. And so it's, it's rare to have obviously a chance to play on home soil, which we value. But we're also feeling a little bit of pressure around the fact that we would normally have eight, nine, ten games to kind of get ready. We're booted by the fact that we have some continuity and some veterans and players that are way smarter than we are in terms of knowing how this thing should look and how it's going to come together. But uh, we're trying. There's tension between you know treating these games as warm-up games and also recognizing that we just aren't that many of them. So that's where a lot of our headspace is at. Does the fact that it's Canada this weekend matter at all because you've got them the first well, the first round of the World Cup? It, would it be better to play them, not to play them? Does that even influence your decision making for the next few days and how you plan for the games? We've thought about it because that's our job, but the, the truth is that there's so few games to prepare, you can't treat one, you know, you can out outsmart yourself if you're not careful, I think. And so uh, these games we will play as real basketball games with the goal to win and play well. 
And I think that given that they're our first two games, that look just like they would if we were playing against somebody that wasn't our first opponent. Um, but we also grant that it won't be, there might be a little bit of that, they think, we think, they think kind of strategy going back and forth. We just don't, we don't value that much, I think, as a team. And I think that we need to be, uh, having the experience of these major tournaments, um, you know, the, the cards are, the people know who each other are. Kevin Pangos was playing against Matthew Delvedova in college for more games than Kevin would probably care to remember. And so that's that's gone on now in different little individual battles all over the world. And um, I think the comments that those guys have made in the media reflects the fact that it's like um, we're not sneaking up anyway. You know? So it's like let's bring what we got and let's play. And just talking about major tournaments, so what were the learning points from Rio, I suppose, for you personally or as was your first Olympics I believe? So even you personally or as a program how you manage that sort of stuff, what were the biggest learnings from what is a very hectic two weeks we have to go there and moving every second day and playing games all the time? The good teams manage the tournament, you know. The, the game you're playing isn't actually the game you're playing. The tournament is the game you're playing. And so all those little skirmishes are relevant to the war, but they're just battles. And so how you keep energy levels high and avoid unnecessary risk and cope with the fact that point spreads matter and that you're trying to win every game by as much as possible or lose a game by as little as possible, that's, that's relevant and different. And it takes a little work to get your head around and work on that today. So, um, but in general, it's just the tournament presents, it's a very unpredictable environment. Like people you think you're gonna play, you don't play. The showers don't have curtains on them sometimes. The bus don't show up sometimes. And so what we speak about a lot is just how, how prepared for what we can't prepare for can be. Uh, that's, I think, a skill and one we work on in the way that we have our scrimmages refereed and the way that we talk to our guys about what is working and what isn't working and what might work. And I think my, not I haven't traveled to China before, but I suspect based on what I'm hearing from my friends that grew up in Australia and are in China far too often, I think this will be um, maybe at the far end of that spectrum. And just one last one about Rio. Like, what is the moment that you think about? I remember speaking to Andrew Bogan and Luke Lockley about it, and while everyone points to that last game and that last play, it was the Serbia game two days earlier, which I think Luke Longley told me he just doesn't know what happened. And it's like, was that just a case of shit happens almost? That was just a bad day where it just didn't go your way? Like, I'm just interested, what is the overwhelming memory from those two weeks where a lot of really good stuff happened? It just wasn't the end point that I knew you guys wanted. Good point. You're a professional. Question asked me. I think, of course, you remember the end, and that disappointment is, you can't shy away from that. I think that going back to my learnings, which is what I experienced watching the Rio tournament, the group of people we have. Part of what makes them exceptional is that the combination of how much they care and the success they've had, I think, is largely attributable to the fact that they take things moment by moment and day by day. Like, I think that if you had told Patty Mills when he was 20 that he was going to be a 10-year veteran and face of a franchise, I think he would have thought you were nuts. But what he was doing on those days ended up looking a lot like what he does on these days, and that gives us a chance to be successful. Matthew Delvedova much the same. Um, and so I, what, I'm, what I feel most confident in about our team is that we have a, a process-oriented approach, a resilience, and a deep belief in each other that we're going to do everything possible and leave no stone unturned to win the country's first medal. And as you said, shots don't go in. You know, in the best league on the planet, in any sport, there's, people get blown out sometimes. And it 
upsets happen, and that's just that is part of it. Um, but it won't be because we didn't prepare. It won't be because we didn't um, pick the right people or put them in the right sets. Um, we will those every one of those decisions is really carefully considered, and um, the spirit around the group I think it is one that I'm really proud of and so humbled to be associated with. I hope that that's what you guys see when you come to the games and when you watch on television over in China. I can actually just got that coaching question from someone in the crowd. So this one's from Matt Daly, who coaches under 12 boys locally here and in the under 16 girls side as well. And he wants to ask about communicating with players. So I hope Matt's in the crowd. Um, Matt's question, he said that he's found that short, sharp messaging is a very effective way of communicating a message to players both individually and in a group. But he was saying that that said, he's always looking for new terms and new methodologies and I suppose new processes to throw at his players. So you've coached G League around the NBA and FIBA, obviously Kevin Durant College were involved with that. So for Matt and anyone that's out there, are there any, I suppose, just coaching techniques or methodologies that you think would be helpful to anyone across any level? It's an awesome question. Matt, where are you? Over there to the right. Sweet. Cool. Um, I don't know. I think about it a lot, and as you can tell, I suck at it because I talk a lot and too much, and um, my clock, my internal clock is just broken. But what I'm trying to do in my own quest to do that better is read as much about, um, just steal good ideas from the people who actually do these jobs for real, not just coaching basketball, so um, educators. So the best book I read in the past few months was Make It Stick. It was focused on how important memory is in learning and in reading that and it kind of assimilated a lot of things that I had observed and read other places in a really, con I think, concise and thoughtful way. And so I would recommend that book as a starting point, um, but I surely could be coached up. So if you're in Sydney, come visit and watch our practice and tell me what you think. Yeah. How's that? Cool. Um, all right, so that's everything I've got. So a big thank you for whoever coming down tonight. And yeah, thank you, Will, and good luck for the month ahead. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So next up we've got a local lad, we've got Adam Westerhout coming up and Adam has spread himself all over Perth and he's also been one of our little sponsors I suppose, for lack of a better term tonight, and really helped us out. So I know some of you are already know Matt and everything he's doing around town, but given there's a lot of hoops heads in the room, I thought it'd be cool to get Adam up on stage and just talk about his journey and what he's done. So please welcome Adam up as well. So will I take a drink, tell the people about Full Court Fitness and everything you've got going on around town. Um, okay, so thanks for having me up here, Ben. Um, I started Full Court Fitness about a year ago, and it essentially is uh, basketball training for casual adult players. So what I found was there's something for juniors developing, there's something for players at the elite level playing state league, but for everyone that plays social league basketball on a weeknight, They've got their one game a week and then that's about it. So, created Full Court Fitness to give them an option to do something else. And so how does one get into that? You obviously you love basketball like we all do, but where was the origin story for, I suppose, really trying to make the coaching clinic side part of your life? Um, so that side came from it. I have personally played um, at state league level, but not a lot of minutes. So I was always like one of the role players on the team or you know just one of the training guys as well. Um, but what I found was when I stopped training there, I really missed the, I guess, the camaraderie and the, the team aspect of training two times a week for about four hours a week. And one side, you, you notice you start putting on a few kilos and you start losing a bit of your fitness. Um, but the other side is you just don't have that regularity there on the court. And then I became that guy that when I was younger, used to be like, we'll come out and play one game a week. And they get so angry because they can't make a jump shot. Um, so you created something where you can go there and practice and just practice your jump shots and and work on your fitness as well and I guess some of the inspiration also came from the success you see with all the high, int high interval intensity training uh, programs right there like F45 and RBT and things like that so um, that was part of the inspiration as well if you can combine those two things 
and it gives some people something that's a bit harder to work out than just a normal social game, then um, yeah, they seem to enjoy it. And I think you're the only person I've got up on a stage like this actually from Perth, so we can actually talk about our little city here. And I'm, I'm just interested, because I've been away for a year and even talking with Will then, we're not people, I, I'm always from here, but I haven't spent much time here. And we talk about how basketball's getting more popular, it's getting bigger, all these cliche things we throw around. But do you feel it happen, and do you sort of see that through your involved with the Wildcats a little bit and what you do? Are you feeling that on a day-to-day -day basis in your little professional world? Uh, I think I do, and, it, and I think anyone here that's from Perth and has been to a Wildcats game in the last, you know, two or three years can definitely notice that. Um, personally, I think, uh, as someone that's followed it since I was, you know, in primary school, um, I guess the biggest thing I see is that there are more casual people uh, that know about the game, that know about players, know about their stories, you know, know where the team's sitting on the ladder. Um, there's more just general knowledge and, and those water cooler conversations going on around workplaces. Um, and even, again, going back to your social basketball, when you catch up with your mates for your game, like those guys that you know that would just always watch NBA and know, you know how many points and rebounds so-and-so has for some obscure team that's not anywhere near the top, like they now know what's going on with the league and you know who the star players are in each team. So yeah, I definitely think it is growing and, and um, reaching another level within within uh, general, yeah. And even just hearing you talk then about community, I get the impression that something you're trying to really do with full core is actually not just be a basketball clinic that can go out and do things in random spots at random time, but to really foster, I suppose, a sense of community to begin with, and then secondly, to, I suppose, embed basketball in that. Is that a fair representation? And I suppose if it is, can you just elaborate on how important that is to you and everything that you're doing? Totally. Uh, community is a big part of it, and um, I think probably everyone in the room would have heard all the stuff going around with Ben Simmons lately, and the way the media has been attacking him as well. Yeah, my bad, sorry, it's not um, But I feel like the, a bit of that has to do with um, basketball culture, not Australian basketball culture, not American basketball culture, but just basketball culture, and the way, I guess, the basketball community interacts, thinks, and acts. And picking up on that, from Full Court Fitness, what I'm trying to do there is, yes, it's a, a fitness basketball training session but everyone that comes along is part of that community and through the through social media I'm able to build on that community and get people interacting with each other so your social league game you've already got your established group of friends you go to play against five strangers you don't care who they are um, have your game you're done whereas if you come down you've got a squad of 15 to 20 people it's different people every week because people are flexible different work rosters and things like that so they come through but you've got that online community, so if you've got your social league game, you can say, just post and, and get someone to fill in. And I find my, being myself like as a coach there, but I'm also trying to network and link people in with different people. So if someone asks me, oh, I'm trying to get a game, let's so speak to someone. So it's just trying to be that, that link between people and, and really build that community. So an example would be um, the next public holiday coming up in September. Um, I've organised a pickup run at Loftus, so that's open to anyone. And we don't really do that too much in Australia, is just have an open run where someone organises it, tells individuals to come down. You don't have to worry about a team, you don't have to worry about players. You just come down and shoot to shoot for teams, winner holds court, and, you, and that's it. And that's how you, you start to build that community and make it easier for people to play basketball and meet people that like basketball as well. And just one more, I suppose, on the typical basketball side of you, a similar question to what I asked Will. Were there any, I suppose, techniques or things that you've learned that work in your world that, I suppose, whether it's the maths question or anyone else in the room, that you think can help anyone out there that's trying to, I suppose, emulate what you do or just help, I suppose, coach their basketball team locally? Um, what I've found, coaching adults, that some have been trained at a junior level, some have never had any um, formal training at, at all, is is demonstrating and, and copying what you see. Um, I found that personally as a junior as well, as you just grew up watching the NBA tape. So I find it quite interesting that everyone around a certain age group has certain um, elements to their body language in their game that mimics like the best player of that era. So there's a, I know there's a big generation of guys older than me that all kind of move a bit like Michael. That's 
high praise there, but I reckon the next phase of kids coming up are all going to move like Steph Curry and, and have that, that quick release, far long range jump shot. So try by doing and watch, watch what you see and try and cop, copy what you see the best players do. Yeah, and I suppose let's mix it up now. You're going to be at the Kendall Games this weekend. I know you got your tickets this morning. What are you looking forward to seeing and what do you think is going to happen this weekend? I'm, I'm not sure. I think, I think the Boomers will split um, the, for these first two games against Canada. I'm really interested to see um, just the level of play of, of Canada. Um, honestly, I don't know many players on their roster. Um, so just seeing what they bring to the table at the international level and just to see some like the, some of the world's best athletes perform I think would be like just really cool. And I know I've taken too much of your time already but before I let you go, the World Cup, that's why we're kind of here talking about it, what do you expect to happen over there both Australia wise and the tournament as a whole? What, I suppose, predictions, Australian stuff, what do you think is going to happen over there? Uh, I don't know what's going to happen but I will be disappointed if we don't medal. Um, or at least have a shot at a medal. I think that's the bare minimum. I think uh, Team USA, despite how many star players they may not have, I still think they're going to be up there. Um, the recent one that was interesting is Serbia, who they've just, I can't pronounce his name, but their point guard, who's out with the injuries. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's a big out for them. So yeah, I think big things for Australia. Uh, all right, cool. So thanks for coming up here. And before you go, tell people that they can find you on uh, social media, whatever you want to be contacted with. I know you'll be around for a bit later, but tell the guys where they can find you. So if anyone's interested or you think you might have friends or family that might be interested in, in checking it out, it's fullcourtfitness.com. Find me on Instagram, hashtag fullcourtfitness. Yeah, I'll be around later. So if you're interested to know more about what we do at the sessions, just yeah, come have a chat and um, hopefully get you down to a session. Cool. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.